first production Audi built on the Volkswagen Group MEB platform for volume all-electric cars is this model, the Q4 e-tron. This aspirational mid-sized crossover is pricier, of course, than other similarly sized full battery powered SUVs from the Wolfsburg conglomerate, but it delivers a much more upmarket feel that'll help ease you into your new electrified phase of motoring ownership. With Audi's first three all-electric e-tron models, we saw what the brand was capable of with EV technology. These three cars, though, the e-tron, the e-tron Sportback and the e-tron GT Quattro, were merely preludes to the EV model that really matters to Ingolstadt, this car, the Q4 e-tron. It's tempting to merely dismiss this model as Audi's version of other similarly sized VW Group crossover EVs like the Volkswagen ID4, the Skoda Enyaq IV and the Cupra Born. Certainly, all the engineering bits that matter are common between the four cars, namely the MEB platform and the battery tech. Yet, Audi claims to have put its own stamp on the way this car drives and feels. We'll see. It's a mark of how important EVs are these days that almost immediately Audi expects this Q4 to eventually become its second best-selling model globally, eclipsed only by the A3. Even its first full year of sales, the brand reckoned that this Q4 would account for nearly 15% of its total orders, which explains why the Ingolstadt maker thinks its entire range will be fully electric by 2033. Audi's already said that it stopped conventional engine development and won't launch any more combustion models after 2026. So this is the future, a model which, as its name suggests, is sized between the Mark's existing mainstream SUVs, the fossil fueled Q3 and Q5 ranges. There are two Q4 body styles, this standard SUV and the sportier looking Q4 Sportback e-tron. Both are produced in the same Zwickau German factory as Volkswagen's ID series EVs, but this Audi has to stretch a bit further up market. Its brief is to bridge the gap between relatively compact mid-sized EVs like the ID4 and larger ones like Jaguar's I-Pace and the Mercedes EQC. That's asking a lot. Can this Ingolstadt model deliver? You'll need the industry's most comprehensive road test review, the car and driving road test, to find out. If you're a typical Audi loyalist used to a car of this size, you won't have driven an EV before because Ingolstadt has never made one, in which case they'll be a little to adapt to. No gear stick, no handbrake and no ignition key, all unnecessary in this new era of motoring. You don't even need to bother with a starter button. The moment you've got yourself comfortable in the high set seating position, the car sensed your presence, so all that's necessary is for you to nudge the stubby gear selector backwards into D with your foot on the brake. You're ready. But for what? Something quite revolutionary for an Audi, that's for sure. Apart from a few track-tamed versions of the R8 supercar, no Audi of the modern era has been rear-driven, but almost all Q4s will be. Have to be, because that's the drive format chosen for the MEB chassis and EV powertrain that this e-tron model borrows from the VW Group parts bin. Two flavours of this confection are offered in the mainstream Q4 range, starting with the 35 e-tron package that gives you a 170 PS electric motor mated to a 52 kilowatt hour battery. Ideally though, you'd want to stretch at least to the 40 e-tron model we're trying here, which has a gutsier 204 PS motor powered by a bigger 76.6 kilowatt hour net output battery which boosts driving range from the rather subpar 208 mile figure of the base version to a more acceptable 316 mile reading. Those mileage stats, by the way, relate to this SUV body style. The alternative Sportback variant sleeker shape enhances those figures by around seven miles. There's also a third Q4 powertrain option, which you might be able to stretch to if you limit yourself with all the extras. A 50 e-tron Quattro variant, which also uses the 76.6 kilowatt hour battery and, as the badging suggests, offers four-wheel drive and more power. But 
you won't feel either of those things in day-to-day -day driving with it because the additional 109 PS motor that's added to the front axle of the 50 variant is never engaged unless maximum traction is needed or you really stamp the throttle down. Should you do that in a 50 model, a 299 PS total output will be released, enough to get you to 62 miles an hour in just 6.2 seconds. That's quite a bit quicker than the two rear-driven versions. The 35 derivative manages 62 miles an hour in 9 seconds, while this 40 version takes 8.5 seconds, both being limited to a top speed of just 99 miles an hour, which seems rather 70s-like. The 50 e-tron Quattro raises that only marginally to 111 miles an hour, still not enough to go autobahn burning, and the extra motor weight that top model has to carry about drops the SUV body style model's driving range figure to 295 miles. In practice then, every Q4 e-tron is basically rear-driven, just like the EV models in this sector that this Audi clones. The Volkswagen ID.4, the Cupra Born, and the Skoda Enyaq IV. And when you drive a Q4 in town, you quickly realize quite a few of the reasons why. There are real advantages in placing the powertrain of a car like this, the electric motor and its associated single-speed auto gearbox, on the back axle, primarily because the front wheels are then freed up for steering duties. The turning circle is a London taxi-like 10.2 metres, better than a tiny Volkswagen Up city car. And as a result, this SUV is superbly manoeuvrable for its size, jinking through traffic hold-ups and darting into spaces. As with other electric vehicles, this one's town travel is characterised by its need to constantly emit a strange E sound intended to warn pedestrians of this Q4's impending approach. You wonder why, though, why it's necessary for this feature to sound so otherworldly. Other brands use film composers to create more pleasant melodies. The rear-driven format also benefits this Audi beyond the city limits, allowing a near 50-50 virtually perfect weight distribution, which, together with the low centre of gravity provided by the central battery pack placement, helps disguise its rather portly curb weight of just over two tonnes. That's almost 300 kilos heavier than a conventional Q5. Despite, or perhaps because of that, traction through the turns is excellent. But as with every EV, you're always subconsciously aware of just how much bulk is impeding your forward motion. We'd hope that Audi might have been able to engineer in a bit more ride and handling polish to the usual VW Group mid-sized EV formula here. But as it turns out, the drive experience is much as it is with a comparable Volkswagen ID.4, which means it's relatively firm. The ride's quite cleverly engineered for suppleness over typical mixed services, but bigger potholes, speed humps and more extreme cases of broken bitumen will really catch it out if your Q4 has the lowered sport suspension fitted with the mid-range S-Line trim level most will want, so try before you buy. Our advice would be to spec up a base sport trimmed model instead, which comes with more comfort orientated springing. Or, with either of the two mainstream spec packages, pay the near £1,000 extra fee that Audi wants for the adaptive suspension with damper control setup that's standard with top Vorsprung trim. We've got adaptive damping here, working through the settings of the usual Audi Drive Select driving mode system, which in its standard form merely alters throttle and steering feel. From the centre touchscreen, you can switch between comfort and dynamic options for normal driving. The difference isn't great between the two without damper control fitted, so you'll probably end up leaving the car in the alternative set and forget auto setting. An individual menu allows you to choose your own parameters and there are other further efficiency and range modes which curb energy consumption by significantly limiting acceleration. What is particularly Audi-like is this car's exemplary cruising demeanour. EVs often aren't as quiet as they're cracked up to be because quite frequently all the lack of engine noise does is to emphasise a lack of development care in reducing the driving din from tyre roar and wind noise. 
But there's very little of that here. A remarkable level of silence prevailing right up to the legal limits where this Q4 has been measured to be three decibels quieter than a Tesla Model 3. A somewhat less satisfying typical Audi trait is the somewhat anaesthetised feel you get through this unusual Quartic steering wheel, embellished but not helped by the brand's progressive steering setup, which uses variable steering rack and pinion gearing to give more direct responses to larger steering angles. To be fair, the rack is direct and weights up nicely with speed, but it seems to have little interest in handling communication, even in the most focused, dynamic drive setting. Those driving range figures we gave you earlier are nowhere near class leading, but at least they appear to be real world accurate, which isn't always the case with EVs. To achieve them though, you'll need to spend quite a lot of the time enduring the slothful throttle response that characterises the efficiency or range driving modes. And with this gear selector switched out of D and engaged in its alternative B or battery mode that summons the car's regenerative braking function. Steering wheel paddles, which annoyingly cost extra, can increase this via three stages, the most aggressive one slowing the car by up to 0.6G. But it's not enough to create the kind of one pedal feature that some EV rivals offer, which causes the car to automatically slow so much off throttle that there's hardly ever any need to actually use the brake. Still, at least the mix of regenerative and friction braking is well judged, despite the fact that, curiously, for such a futuristic car, the rear wheels have old-fashioned brake drums rather than discs. At higher speeds, when you'll dispense with the regenerative harvesting, it's hard not to be impressed by the sophisticated drive systems that marching progress has brought with it. This Audi's adaptive cruise assist setup, for instance, unfortunately fitted only with top Vorsprung trim or as part of an expensive assistance package advanced pack. This is a camera and radar sensor controlled assistance system that will autonomously accelerate, brake and steer your Q4 while maintaining a safe distance from vehicles ahead. This incorporates the usual Audi predictive efficiency assistant, which uses navigation data and road sign info gained from the car's forward facing camera to make a series of apparently simple yet actually very complex calculations. These prompt you to lift off the accelerator as you approach a bend or a town boundary, while at the same time the car's drive system performs optimum energy recuperation to maximise battery range. If you're the kind of driver who'd quite like on occasion to accelerate, brake and steer this Q4 yourself, then you'll want to know how it might perform on your favourite back route home. Pushing on a bit on a road like that, well yes, you'll feel that prodigious curb weight with an initial reluctance to turn into tight corners at speed, but Persevere and the car's various tractional tools with well-judged stability control intervention and an XDS differential lock to some extent help all that bulk to work for you, planting the car reassuringly into the tarmac in a manner that really inspires confidence. It feels quite good through faster corners as well, helped by the way that this Audi EV differs from its combustion counterparts in the placement of the steering rack ahead of the front axle. So there you have it, the future of conventional motoring according to Audi and one of the first volume selling predominantly rear driven cars the brand has brought us since the 1930s. You might have hoped for something a fraction more Vorsprung Dirk Technik, but you're certainly served up a confection here that's distinctively Audi. Here we've got what Audi calls the next step in its design language for electric models, an approach heralded by the Q4 concept car the brand unveiled back at the Geneva Motor Show in 2019. A lot's changed in the world since then, of course, but the look of this Q4 hasn't. The shape characterised by short overhangs, large wheels and a surface treatment that's clear and paired back, but also intersected by super precise high definition lines. You might struggle to call it pretty, but it's certainly striking, especially in the alternative Sportback e-tron form that offers a sportier looking body style option for prospective Q4 folk. 
Size-wise, as its badging suggests, this car's 4.59 metre footprint positions it between the brand's Q3 and Q5 models in the heart of the mid-sized EV crossover segment. The profile perspective, though, reminds us far more of the company's smaller Q2, aggressive and high-waisted with a kicked-up crease that flows back over the muscular haunches. In profile, you notice not only these tiny overhangs, which are virtually non-existent, but the shortness of the bonnet and the extreme rake of the windscreen framed by forward-set A-pillars. The angle D-pillar of this standard SUV body style has a black upper strip that creates a neat floating roof effect, something the alternative Sportback model with its swept-back silhouette doesn't bother with. Avoid this base sport level of trim and the car gets a sport suspension package lowering it by 15 millimetres. Wheel sizes with both body styles range between 19 and 21 inches. We've got 20 inch 5 Y spoke graphite alloy rims here. The front end has a lot to say too, mainly courtesy of this rather in your face multifaceted e tron branded version of the brand's usual single frame front grille, which isn't a grille, of course, this being an EV, but has been retained by designer Mark Lichter to keep the sense of brand continuity that many rival models in this segment have lost. Outer black framing flows into these LED headlights of the intelligent matrix sort, each one with 16 individually activated LEDs, which give you more precisely targeted illumination and the option of selecting between four variable digital light signatures. There's lots of frontal black detailing, particularly around these ribbed corner cutouts, which appear to serve no useful purpose other than to house the front parking sensors. And the SUV credentials are underlined by this lower silvered strip. The rear might just be the Q4's most appealing angle. LED tail lights flow into the usual Audi central red strip, which, if matrix headlights have been specified, illuminates as part of an expressive light sculpture inspired by intricate electric circuits and bearing the four rings radiating in signature red as its central detail. The Sportback version looks quite different from here, of course, with its spoiler framing the lower rather than the upper part of the tailgate glass. Both variants get quite intricate lower bumper detailing, which includes an e-tron inset designation and looks much smarter with a sportier design provided above this particular test car's entry level of trim. More importantly, under all of this sits the car's sophisticated MEB platform, development of which has taken the lion's share of the £54 billion the Volkswagen Group has spent in developing its new era EV technology. This chassis is, of course, shared with all other Volkswagen Group brands. It already features in close group rivals like the Skoda Enyaq iV, the Cupra Born and the Volkswagen ID4. Plus, it'll also be licensed out to Ford with the result that there could be up to 20 million cars running on these same underpinnings by 2029. Right, enough with the outside. Let's take a look in the cabin. It's certainly nothing like anything you'll have seen from any previous Audi. Everything on the upper level is angular, with none of the elements appearing to blend very harmoniously with each other. But it all kind of works and feels far more mature than the rather self-consciously funky vibe championed by Volkswagen's ID models. There's an unusual jutting lower console trimmed in smudge-worthy piano black for the neat little gear selector slider. And just above, the silver-trimmed central fascia section incorporates horizontal vents with a sweep across the cabin that gets interrupted by this beady-browed instrument binnacle. If you have a Q4 with brake recuperation paddles, that binnacle's 10.25-inch virtual cockpit screen has to be viewed through this rather weird Cortex steering wheel with flattened top and bottom sections. Futuristic? You'd say so. Premium, possibly, but only if you really spend some cash on a more upmarket level of trim than we have here. Full leather and the ambient lighting package would lift this cabin a whole lot. You might yearn for yesteryear when getting to grips with some of the functionality features here, like the fiddly little circular lower audio controller and the awkward touch slider functions on the steering wheel spokes. But you probably take all of this over the confusing ergonomics of this car's closest cousin, the Volkswagen ID4. Compared to that car, you could almost call the cabin of this Q4 conventional. 
The gear selector is at least here in the right place, and ordinary direct access temperature controls replace the ID4's awful sliders. It also helps that the driving position is set quite high, which is just as well because the short bonnet drops away sharply from your viewpoint, sometimes making it a little difficult to judge the length of the car's nose when slotting this Audi into tight spaces. Unlike the larger e-tron SUV, you don't get a lower infotainment screen in the centre of the dash. So there's just this 11.6 inch MMI Navigation Plus central display. This screen would rather be tapped than touched, which then delivers you its haptic feedback click. And accessing everything you need is pretty straightforward. The main menu has the usual radio, media, telephone, nav and apps options, plus a car section which is where all the charging and efficiency features reside. You can swipe right for a customizable split screen layout or left for the weather, news and calendar sections that are delivered via the incorporated Audi Connect navigation and infotainment package, which also includes services like traffic information online and a Wi-Fi hotspot. When you're in particular sections, helpful shortcut options on the right-hand edge of the screen allow you to quickly navigate onto what you need. This infotainment monitor's state-of-the-art MIB3 modular infotainment platform can't allow you to play games or watch Netflix, as the comparable system can in a Tesla, but it's certainly quite rapid at delivering the info you need. There's conformity to the fast LTE advanced transmission standard, and you get natural voice control too, though it's still not as intuitive as the systems from BMW and Mercedes. And of course, the usual Apple CarPlay or Android Auto phone mirroring tech. Everything else you need to know lies on the 10.25 inch virtual cockpit instrument screen we referenced earlier, which changes its layout according to the way you tap this view button on the steering wheel spoke. With the conventional version of this display we have here, you get two layout options, either a main gauge with flanking info or a widescreen layout. An upgraded Virtual Cockpit Plus binnacle screen package gives you a third e-tron display option. And most of the time, you're probably going to be in this main gauge layout, which has a centre section prioritising range, gear selection and drive mode info, surrounded by a charge meter on the left and battery level on the right. The flanking right-hand information box prioritises energy consumption and drive assist features, while the panel on the left can be customised to show either date and time, range, trip and computer data, drive assist info or a traffic sign display. Use the view button to switch to the alternative widescreen layout and what's prioritised will be determined by a horizontal sweep of this little steering wheel button between car, audio, phone and nav options. Regardless of your choice, there are little cutout sections on the screen to brief you on things like energy consumption, range, speed, battery level and drive assist info. Enough with screens. What else might you need to know? Well, look carefully around the cabin and there are a few things you might not expect to find in an Audi, like some harder, rougher surfaces and door pockets that lack the felt or rubber linings you'd usually find from the brand. There's nowhere to rest your hand when using the central screen, which makes its use slightly less comfortable than it should be and might remind you how much easier the functionality would be with a lower rotary controller like the one you get in a rival BMW i4. The seats are quite supportive and feature standard heating and powered lumbar support, but here at least there's not much of an opulent ambience. What Audi calls the routine cloth finish of the upholstery on this base sports spec model looks and feels, well, <laughs> routine. So you'd ideally want to stretch to the smarter suede-like Dynamica microfiber and faux leather combination offered by mid-level S-Line spec, much of which is fashioned from recycled plastic bottles. There are some nice extra technology touches if you can afford to add them. This is the first Audi to feature an augmented reality head-up display, which reflects information like navigational commands onto the windscreen in two different fields and in varying depths of field. There's also a 10-speaker, 580-watt audio upgrade package developed by Sonos, which uses what's called the Sonamic Panorama algorithm, developed apparently by the Fraunhofer Institute. This uses stereo recordings to deliver three-dimensional surround sound that places the individual sound sources on a virtual U-shaped soundstage within the car, 
which gives the user the impression of sitting right in the middle of the orchestra or the band. As for practicalities, well, it's a mixed bag here. This lidded box between the seat is nice and deep and incorporates a neat ratcheting top, but the over-prominent cup holders just in front of it, which ought to be covered by some kind of sliding top to justify this cabin's supposed premium status, don't get the necessary clamp elements to keep beverages from sloshing about unless you pay extra for an optional function package. You'll need that package to get a lock on the glove box, which incorporates a pen clip and a coin tray, but is nowhere near as big as it looks, and the decently sized door bins lack bottle holders. There's no overhead sunglasses compartment, and you only get a ticket clip on the driver's sun visor. Right, time to take a look in the rear. Now, despite the fact that this car's 2,764 millimeter wheelbase is the same length as that of a little Volkswagen ID3 family hatch, it ought to be pretty spacious back here because there's well over 80 millimeters more length between the axles than you get in a conventional Audi Q5. And sure enough, once inside, there's a lot more space than the outward dimensions might suggest. The need to house the big battery under this rear bench brings with it the benefit of positioning back seat folks 70 millimetres higher than those in the front, giving them an excellent view forward, though a little at the expense of headroom. Mind you, that's something taller occupants will only really more acutely notice if the panoramic glass roof has been specified. It's also a wider cabin than you'd expect a relatively compact mid-sized SUV to be able to provide. And with no central transmission tunnel to obstruct things, three adults could actually fit reasonably easily into the back of this car. This bench doesn't either slide or recline as it could in a Q5 or an arrival BMW iX3. And disappointingly, you have to pay extra for that function package we mentioned earlier to get an armrest and these netted seat back pockets. Further down the range, these twin USB-C ports cost more too. Rear seat climate control is included though for these twin centre vents and you get individual overhead reading lights and coat hooks in the grab handles. And there are reasonably sized door bins with a separate bottle holder on each side of the car ahead of the electric window switch. Let's finish with the look at the boot. Now, you are, by the way, going to have to use this boot for cargo storage. Unlike some other EVs, there's no extra luggage room in the nose of the car, which is taken up by the power electrics for the driveline. Unlike in volume versions of the ID4, power assistance for this tailgate is standard across the range and it rises to reveal a 520 litre space in this SUV model. Curiously, it's actually more in the Sportback version, 535 litres. Either way, this capacity is usefully better than class rivals like the Mustang Mach-E and the Nissan Ariya, but somewhat less than the 543 litre figure offered by the ID4 and way less than the 585 litre capacity of a boxier Skoda Enyaq IV. For perspective, a conventional Audi Q5 gives you a minimum boot size of 550 litres, that optional function package. It's necessary to get a 12 volt socket, a luggage net and a luggage compartment cover that can be stored beneath the cargo area. And you'll also need that extra cost package to get this variable height boot floor, though that's not much use if, as will be customary, you have the charging lead beneath, impeding the lower position. Beneath the lower floor, more space is available in this improperly finished area next to the car's electric motor. Once you get your items in, the space provided is square and very usable with wide recesses at either side so that things like golf club bags will more easily fit. Up to nine carry-on suitcases could be accommodated Two more than you'd get in a rival Ford Mustang Mach-E, but one less than you'd manage in a Tesla Model 3. There are four body-coloured tie-down points, a bag hook and a bright light on each side and a warning triangle neatly incorporated into the inner part of the tailgate. 
unless you stretch to a really pricey level of trim, the rear bench doesn't split flexibly 40-20-40 like it does in, say, that BMW iX3 we mentioned earlier. And there's no ski hatch option. Flattening this 60-40 split rear bench frees up 1,490 litres of capacity loaded to roof height. It's 1,460 litres with a sportback body style. There's no fold-flat front passenger seat option that would enable you to carry longer items like surfboards. So these will need to go on the roof, which, equipped with the appropriate cross rails, can take up to 75 kilos of load. You'd expect to have to pay a little more for an Audi EV, but just how much more and what kind of value proposition does that represent? Well, we'll take a look at that now. There's quite a price span. From launch, Audi was asking in the 40 to £65,000 range, and navigating the Q4 lineup might seem quite daunting at first glance, with a variety of battery sizes, electric motor outputs, charging capacities, trim options, and possible accessories. So we'll try to run you through it in a straightforward way. Your first choice is body style. There's a swoopy Q4 Sportback e-tron variant available with a rakish roof line and slightly less space for more money. Of course, think around £1,500 more than the regular Q4 e-tron we're testing here. But this standard body style, the company thinks, will account for 84% of Q4 sales. The versions available across the two body styles are identical, as are the three core trim levels, this base sport version, then S-line and top Vorsprung. So which body shape you'd go for is simply a matter of preferences and priorities. As usual with an EV, there's no choice of gearbox. All variants use the same single speed, also transmission. Very unusually for an Audi, this gearbox is mated to rear-wheel drive with the volume variants. And things kick off with the 35 e-tron models, which use a 170 PS electric motor on the rear axle, mated to a 52 kilowatt hour battery that delivers up to 208 miles on a charge. There's a big price jump, just over £4,000, to get yourself the alternative 40 e-tron variant that we're trying here, which has a gutsier 204 PS motor powered by a larger 76.6 kilowatt hour net output battery, capable of up to 316 miles of range. To go further means stretching to well over £51,000 and getting yourself the 50 e-tron, which has motors on both axles, hence its higher total output of 299 PS and Quattro four-wheel drive capability. There's the same 76.6 kilowatt hour battery though as the 40 model, which burdened a little by the extra weight of the all wheel drive setup will take you up to 295 miles. Right, what other alternatives to Q4 ownership could you be considering here? Well, let's start with those you'll find on the other side of your local Audi Center's showroom floor. You could have a conventional diesel Q5 40 TDI for about the same price as this Q4 40 e-tron model, around £45,000. And the price tag of a top Q4 50 e-tron, just over £50,000, would alternatively get you a Q5 in plug-in hybrid petrol 50 TFSI E quattro form with up to 37 miles of range. For reference, the next model up in Audi's EV range, the full-sized e-tron SUV, is priced from just over £60,000 in 50 quattro form, but in that guise will only take 212 miles on a charge, about the same as the base 35 e-tron version of this Q4. But of course, you won't only be considering other Audis in choosing this car. The range of compact to mid-sized EV crossovers and SUVs available in the UK is now broad and wide. With three of the available Volkswagen Group alternatives, the Volkswagen ID4, the Cupra Born and the Skoda Enyaq IV, all sharing exactly the same engineering as this Q4. In rough terms, you can think in terms of these three undercutting Q4 prices by around £5,000. There's another similarly engineered segment contender too, the Ford Mustang Mach-E. The Blue Oval brand's shortcut into this segment was to buy much of its EV tech from the VW Group. 
Now, you'd only really be looking at that Ford if you were considering a 40 or 50 series Q4 model because the Mach-E comes only with either a battery featuring a usable 68 kilowatt hours from around £43,000 or with one offering a usable 88 kilowatt hours from around £48,000. What about other contenders in this class? Well, Nissan's Aria is an interesting option with pricing starting from around £42,000 for the base 63 kilowatt hour model. And if you want something with a smarter badge in the 40 to 50,000 pound bracket, you could also consider premium segment contenders like the Volvo XC40 Recharge, pure electric, the Mercedes EQA and the Polestar 2. Or if you're happy with a saloon rather than an SUV hatch, the Tesla Model 3. The Lexus UX300e SUV also sits in this price sector. But that's not so tempting because its 54.3 kilowatt hour battery will only take you up to 186 miles. If you're looking at the top Q450 e-tron and don't want the only slightly cheaper, mechanically identical Volkswagen Group alternatives, the ID4 GTX and the Enyaq IV VRS, then we've got two key options for you. Around £55,000, about the price of a better spec Q450 e-tron, gets you Tesla's Model Y in long-range dual-motor all-wheel drive form, a car with a much longer 331-mile range than the top version of this Audi. But maybe not quite the same kind of premium feel. If you can stretch to just over £60,000, you might get that from BMW's slightly larger iX3, but that's rear-driven only. Push on further into the sixty-five to £70,000 bracket and you can start to look at cars like Jaguar's I-Pace and the Mercedes EQC, but they more naturally compete with the larger Audi e-tron SUV model we mentioned earlier. After considering all of these options, it's very possible that you might conclude that there's nothing quite like a Q4 e-tron in this segment. In which case, you'll want to know just how generous Audi has been with Q4 specification. So, time to have a look at that now. All Q4s get LED headlights, LED tail lamps, a power-operated tailgate, aluminium roof rails, e-tron puddle lights, rear parking sensors and alarm, the Audi Drive Select driving mode system and the brand's progressive steering system, which reduces the amount of lock you have to put on through turns and when parking. When you're slotting into a space or driving slowly in town, an acoustic vehicle alert system will warn unwary pedestrians of your approach and, as well as the usual Mode 3 Type 2 charging cable for wall boxes and public chargers, Audi also includes a Type 2 Mode 2 compact e-tron charging system cable with a domestic plug. Inside, common features across the Q4 range include the 10.25-inch Audi Virtual Cockpit instrument binnacle screen, three-zone automatic air conditioning, an auto-dimming rear-view mirror, a reversing camera, cruise control, an eight-speaker 160-watt Audi sound system, and front sports seats with heating and powered lumbar support. Infotainment's taken care of by an 11.6-inch MMI Navigation Plus central display with 3D navigation and a smartphone interface which gives you Apple CarPlay and Android Auto connectivity. You also get a three-year subscription to Audi's Connect Navigation and Infotainment Plus package which gets you things like a Wi-Fi hotspot, an e-tron route planner, weather information, online news, Google mapping and information on parking and points of interest along your route. You can take Audi Connect connectivity with you even when you're not with your Q4 e-tron thanks to the improved My Audi app. Via this you can schedule charging and either preheat or pre-cool the cabin before you get to the car. Plus, the My Audi app will do all of the things you get using it with a conventional Audi model. It transmits points of interest to the navigation system, streams music and can transfer your calendar to the MMI infotainment screen. The app also allows you to seamlessly plan a route across multiple devices. So if you're going to a restaurant in an unfamiliar city, for example, and have to park a few streets away from the venue, navigation will continue with you on your smartphone as you complete the journey on foot. 
And finally, as usual with vehicle apps of this sort, you can use it to get a vehicle status report and to lock or unlock the doors from wherever you are. So that's covered common Q4 features across the range. So let's get on to the differentiating items between the various trim levels. Starting with the base sport level of trim, we have here. These versions get 19 inch graphite grey alloy wheels with a special aero design, while the lower section of the bumper and the diffuser are painted in contrasting metallic Manhattan grey. Inside of the Sport variant, the front seats will be finished in routine cloth. There are black painted inlays with silver accents and you get a twin spoke leather multifunction steering wheel. Lots of potential customers though are going to want to find a couple of extra thousand pounds. Audi wants to graduate up to mid-range S-line trim. That gets you a significantly more dynamic look thanks to lowered sport suspension, sportier front and rear styling treatment, larger 20-inch 5 Y-spoke alloy wheels, rear privacy glass and additional chrome elements for the octagonal Audi single-frame front grille. The inside gets an upgrade with S-Line trim too, thanks to a perforated leather-stitched steering wheel, an ambient lighting package, inlays in dark matte brushed aluminium, stainless steel pedals, a black cloth headliner, and upholstery in pulse cloth and leatherette. If budget's not quite such an issue, you'll be directed to top Vorsprung spec, recognisable by 21-inch 5-arm rotor Evo Audi Sport alloy wheels, a black styling package and a contrasting Manhattan grey finish for the bumpers. Plus, you get a panoramic glass roof, advanced key keyless entry and damper control for the suspension, so you can adjust ride quality via the various drive select drive modes. With a Vorsprung model, adaptive cruise control, an augmented reality head-up display and the Audi Parking System Plus setup that steers you into spaces all make day-to-day -day driving easier and there are extra safety features to make it safer too. An upgraded virtual cockpit plus instrument binnacle display gives you an extra e-tron display option. And luxury features at this level include fine Nappa leather with contrast stitching for the front sports seats and a Sonos premium sound system with 10 speakers and 580 watts of output. Right, what about options? Well, in terms of luxury on Sport and S-Line models, we'd be tempted to add suspension damper control, ambient lighting and that Sonos premium sound system, if budget allowed. And we'd also like the augmented reality navigation system, which could be added in via an optional technology pack, which also includes the virtual cockpit plus instrument display, the Audi phone box wireless charging mat and twin USB-C ports in the back. With Sport and S-Line models, you're going to need to find £285 more for the flat-topped and bottomed Quartic-style steering wheel you have to have to get the paddles giving you closer control of brake energy recuperation. What else? Well, if you haven't stretched to top Vorsprung trim, but you've got a bit of extra budget in hand, the Comfort and Sound Pack is worth looking at. This includes the Audi Parking System Plus Auto Parking Setup, Adaptive Cruise Control and the Sonos Premium Sound System. In terms of individual options, you might also want to consider acoustic glazing for the front doors, the larger 11.6 inch size available for the central infotainment screen and intelligent matrix LED headlights, each one with 16 individually activated LEDs, which give you more precisely targeted illumination and the option of selecting between four variable digital light signatures. As for practical touches, well, we'd want the wall-mounted garage bracket Audi provides for the compact e-tron charging system. It's a pity you have to pay nearly a £1,000 extra for a heat pump, which preserves battery range in really cold winter weather. And talking of things that perhaps should be standard, Audi wants £325 more for a so-called function package which gives you seat back pockets, a lock for the glove box, a variable loading floor, a 12 volt socket, a luggage compartment cover and a luggage net. 
active folk will want to add the roof cross rails that will enable them to specify a roof box and or carriers for skis, kayak or bicycles. And you can add a tow bar too, which can take an additional bike carrier. For the boot, you can add a luggage compartment shell and a foldable luggage compartment box. And there are all weather floor mats, a car cover, mud flaps, a dash cam and even an espresso mobile coffee maker. Bear in mind that you'll almost certainly need to pay your Audi Centre more for your choice of paint colour. There are eight different finishes, including a new metallic shade, Aurora Violet, previously reserved for Audi Sport high-performance models. The only no-cost shade you can specify, though, is solid pebble grey. We've got metallic glacier white here. You may also want to look at a wheel upgrade. This sport model has 20-inch, 5Y spoke graphite rims and other aesthetic options include various key covers and projection lights into the footwells. And you can have an interior package on Sport and S-Line models that adds twin leather upholstery. With S-Line spec, you've the alternative of a sportier looking Dynamica microfiber and leatherette upholstery combination too. Let's finish, as we always do, with a look at safety. Now, you'd expect some sort of forward collision warning autonomous braking system on a car of this kind these days, and Audi's called theirs pre-sense front with pedestrian and cyclist detection. And as usual with these sorts of setups, it scans the road ahead as you drive, and if a potential collision hazard is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Every Q4 also gets a lane departure warning lane keeping system that warns you when you stray out of your lane and applies gentle steering assistance to ease you back into it. In addition, there's a driver alert feature which monitors your reactions for drowsiness and will, if necessary, prompt you to stop for a restorative coffee. And you get swerve assist to help with high speed avoidance manoeuvres, plus a speed limiter and a turn assist feature that stops you from turning into a junction into the path of another car. Plus, there's camera based traffic sign recognition, which pictures speed signs as you pass and displays them on the dash. All of this is in addition to all the more usual features that come fitted on every Audi family model, which have together helped to justify this car's five-star Euro NCAP safety test showing. There are twin front, side and curtain airbags, though disappointingly you don't also get an extra one to protect the driver's knees. You do, though, get a clever centre airbag, a feature first introduced with the Volkswagen ID3. In the event of a side impact or a rollover, this airbag can prevent the driver and front passenger from colliding with each other. There are, of course, ISOFIX child seat fastenings on the rear bench. And it's also worth mentioning that one of the features of the My Audi app we mentioned earlier is an emergency call or e-call SOS system that in the event of an accident where the airbags are triggered will automatically alert the rescue services with your exact GPS location. Other conventional safety features include the normal ESC stability control and ASR traction control systems, plus an ABS braking system further assisted by CBC or cornering brake control through the bends, plus an HBA or hydraulic braking assistant, which helps reduce stopping time when you really slam on all the anchors in an emergency. Plus, all Q4s get a hill hold function to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, along with tyre pressure monitoring. That's the extent of the safety kit you get on the Sport and S-Line variants, but as we mentioned earlier, at the top of the range, the plush Vorsprung spec with more camera safety items feature. At this level, you get a side assist blind spot monitor to stop you from dangerously pulling out in front of other vehicles. Exit warning, which alerts occupants just about to open a door in the face of oncoming traffic. And emergency assist, a setup which can take over driving duties completely should you become incapacitated steering the car to the side of the road and bringing it to a safe and gradual stop. There's also cross-traffic assist rear, which warns you of oncoming traffic when you're reversing. 
Audi pre-sense basic, which senses when an impact is inevitable and pre-tensions the seat belts and, if necessary, shuts the windows and the sunroof so you can better withstand it. And pre-sense rear, which activates pre-sense basic if a rear collision is inevitable. Vorsprung spec also gets a piece of technology that Audi's particularly proud of, Adaptive Cruise Assist, which combines the functionality of adaptive cruise control with active lane assist. This is a camera and radar sensor controlled assistance system that will autonomously accelerate, brake and steer your Q4 while maintaining a safe distance to vehicles ahead, as long as you keep your hands on the wheel. All of this Vorsprung safety and drive assist tech can be added into more affordable Sport and S-Line spec Q4s at extra cost. For £650 more, the Safety Package Plus gives you side assist with exit warning, rear cross-traffic assist, Audi Presense Basic and Audi Presense Rear. For £1,425, the Assistance Package Advanced adds the autonomous drive tech, principally the adaptive cruise assist system we just mentioned, which comes with the emergency assist system. With the assistance package advanced pack on your Q4, you also get adaptive cruise control and the parking system plus setup to steer you into spaces. If you're choosing an all-electric Audi crossover and want an acceptable level of driving range from it, then you need to ignore the smallest battery models. We found that to be the case when we tested the brand's full-sized e-tron SUV in 2019 and came across the base 50 Quattro version offering less drive mileage than a little Renault Zoe Super Mini, just 212 miles. If you've already viewed our driving experience section, you'll know that the situation is the same here. The base Q4 35 e-tron's 52 kilowatt hour battery, capable of just 208 miles between charges in SUV form. And that's a best possible low spec sport model figure. With the bigger wheels of top Vorsprung trim, that reading falls to just 193 miles. The time is quickly approaching when this kind of showing just isn't going to be acceptable from a car in this class. Fortunately for Audi, you'll also know from our comments earlier that the version of this car most will choose, the Q440 e-tron model we're trying here, gets a great deal more from its larger 76.6 kilowatt hour net output battery, 316 miles, as you'd hope it would given a price increase of over £4,000. For completion, we'll also repeat the driving range figure we gave you earlier for the top dual motor Q450 e-tron Quattro SUV variant, 295 miles. Again, we're quoting best possible figures based around the smaller 19-inch wheels you get with more affordable sport spec. And it's worth pointing out that all these stats all apply to this SUV body style. The sleeker sportback versions can go around seven miles further on a charge. All of this, as you would expect, pretty much duplicates the showing you'd get from comparable versions of this Audi's identically engineered cousins, the Volkswagen ID4, the Cupra Born, and the Skoda Enyaq IV. But it's not enough to put this Q4 e-tron 40 models range on a par with this segment's higher achievers. A two-wheel drive Kia EV6 with a 77 kilowatt hour battery manages 328 miles. The Polestar 2 in 78 kilowatt hour long range standard motor, single motor form manages 335 miles. The Tesla Model 3 in long range guise can take you up to 360 miles between charges. And a BMW i4 eDrive 40 manages 367 miles. We should be fair to Audi and also point out that plenty of other segment rivals do a lot worse than a Q440 e-tron. Comparable versions of the Mercedes EQA and the Volvo XC40 Pure Electric both have range figures rooted in the mid to upper 200s. The Lexus UX300e 
is even worse. No version of the Nissan Aria or the Hyundai Ioniq 5 can beat the range figure of the Q440 e-tron either. And you have to pay nearly £50,000 for the extended range version of a Ford Mustang Mach-E if you're to better it with that car. It's also worth pointing out that the three fractionally larger premium EV crossovers that wealthier Q4 owners might be considering all lag way behind a Q440 e-tron 2, namely the BMW iX3 at 285 miles, the Mercedes EQC at 259 miles and the Jaguar I-Pace at 300 miles. All the stats we've quoted, by the way, are the official WLTP ones. As usual with EVs, you'll need to bear in mind they could drop considerably in winter weather. And they certainly will if you cover long motorway journeys, cart heavy loads, or choose a route with many steep gradients. Of course, in all of this, we've assumed that driving range is the be-all and end-all factor for likely customers, as it often is with EVs. But if you'll merely be using this Q4 as a second car for mainly suburban duties, the total mileage figure it ultimately delivers between charges might not hugely matter. After all, the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders tells us that 94% of UK journeys are of less than 24 miles. Whatever the range showing of the Q4 model you select, it will, as ever on an EV, be most heavily influenced by driving style and the amount of brake energy regeneration going on as you travel. You'll need to select the car's most frugal efficiency drive mode to get anywhere near the official range figures, of course, which has the downside of restricting throttle travel and air conditioner output. You'll also need to be frequently selecting the B regenerative braking setting provided by the gear selector. With this engaged, the electric motor functions as a generator and feeds power back into the battery, something you can build on by making sure recuperation is activated in the efficiency assist section of the center screen. And if your Q4 has steering wheel paddles, using them with the most powerful of the brake recuperation levels engaged, which will result in quite significant off-throttle retardation, up to 0.6G, claims Audi. If you don't use the efficiency mode and the various brake recuperation settings regularly, the range figure drops quite a bit, but that's true of all EVs. We've been averaging about 250 to 270 miles of range from this Q440 e-tron model on this test which we'd suggest will probably be pretty typical, though in one instance, with brisk driving and the heater going, that dropped down to around the 200 mile mark. In all circumstances, the car will do its best to help you. You'll want to keep an eye, for instance, on the charging section of the center screen, which has a clickable green bar showing a target range figure, plus your potential projected mileage on the current charge in everyday use and over longer distances. It'll help quite a lot if your Q4 has the clever adaptive cruise assist setup fitted. This draws on navigation data and road signs detected by the car's forward-facing camera so that if your Q4 is approaching a bend or a town boundary, the system can visually indicate that you should lift off the accelerator. This apparently simple yet complex calculation allows the car's drive system to perform optimum energy recuperation, thereby supporting optimum range performance. Designer Mark Lichter and his team also knew during development that aerodynamics would be a key factor here. This SUV Q4 body style achieves quite a slippery drag coefficient for a crossover of 0.28 CD, a figure the Sportback version improves to 0.26. Little design details add crucial miles, the front radiator's electric louvre, for instance, which opens only when powertrain cooling's really necessary, gaining four miles of range. Three-dimensional spoilers in front of the front wheels also optimise the airflow, adding almost nine miles to the range. And a partial covering for the control arms of the rear axle gives another boost of just over two miles. At the front, the narrow vertical bars below the headlights channel the airstream smoothly along the vehicle's side, resulting in a three-mile range uplift and a minute step on the exterior mirror housings known as the turbulator edge 
allows the airflow to swirl in a targeted way, which is good for another mile. The aero-optimised wheels with their flat designs also facilitate low-loss airflow, notching up an additional three miles, and even the tailgate seal plays its part. Designed to handle the pressure conditions generated by the roof edge spoiler, it adds just over two more miles to the range. We mentioned earlier that driving range figures could be influenced quite a lot by really cold weather. Now, during bad winter conditions, you can, in theory, improve the quoted figures, or at least preserve them, by specifying the optional energy-efficient heat pump that Audi wants to charge you £950 more for, but which some competing models in this segment, the Mercedes EQA, for instance, rightly include as standard. Checking out owners' forums across the EV market reveals that this doesn't always happen in practice, though. Talking of cold weather, it'll help driving range quite a lot if you warm up the cabin before you get to the car so that potentially the energy to drive the heater can still be drawn when it's still plugged in. You can do this via a setting screen on the provided My Audi app. If you've mentally switched off during that little range rundown, you can rejoin us now with the news that overall, though we'd like this car's range returns to be better, it delivers a pretty class competitive showing. Time to move on to issues of charging, a whole new regime to get used to for a lot of likely customers. Audi reckons it's merely about a change of mindset in the way you think about fuel. Instead of driving to a filling station to refill an empty tank, electric cars, so the thinking goes, redefine parking time as charging time, which is great in theory as long as the parking location you need enables you to plug in. And there, of course, is the biggest EV issue, particularly for UK customers, our nation's awful public charging infrastructure. Unlike rival Tesla, Audi doesn't have its own brand network of charging stations to take up the slack. Until that changes, quite a few potential Q4 customers might regretfully turn instead to a Model 3 or a Model Y. Let's get to battery replenishment times for this Ingolstadt EV. If they're quick and you'll mainly be using this Audi for short suburban trips, then again, you might feel that overall range doesn't matter much. So, has charge been mastered here? Well, this Q4 doesn't have the fancy 800-volt battery architecture that you'll find in Audi's larger e-tron GT, but that only benefits you with faster charging times if you're able to find one of the new generation of ultra-fast 270 kilowatt public chargers that are few and far between in Europe and vanishingly rare here. The capacity at which you'll be able to charge your Q4 depends on the powertrain package you've chosen. The 52 kilowatt hour battery of the base 35 e-tron model can be charged at HPC or high power charging stations at a charging capacity of up to 100 kilowatts. The larger 76.6 kilowatt hour net output battery pack of the 40 and 50 series models can charge at up to 135 kilowatts. At 135 kilowatts, the battery can achieve an 80% state of charge from a 5% starting point in 29 minutes. WLTP testing has confirmed that this 76.6 kilowatt hour Q4 40 e-tron can recharge enough electricity to cover a distance of about 80 miles in around 10 minutes. Audi drivers have access to the ECS or e-tron charging service, which at the time of this test had 11,950 affiliated charging points in the UK alone, all of which should be discoverable via the car's navigation system, which usefully recommends chargers along any preset route. You can pay for each connected up session with a single membership card, which entitles you to fixed tariff use. Back at home, an AC1 phase 7.4 kilowatt garage wall box would replenish the 52 kilowatt hour 30 e-tron model from zero in about seven and a half hours. Think about 11 and a half hours for the 76.6 kilowatt hour variant, though with that larger battery model, you can almost halve that time if your property or business can support a gutsier AC3 11 kilowatt charger. 
At the other extreme, think in terms of needing to double the 7.4 kilowatt garage wall box charging times we've just quoted if you merely connect to a conventional three pin domestic socket, though Audi does at least throw in the extra lead you'll need for this as standard. So once you've got your charging regime sorted out, what does it all boil down to in pounds, shillings and pence? Well, at the time of this test, in early 2022, a full charge of this 76.6 kilowatt hour 40 e-tron model on a typical electricity tariff was costing around £11. That's around three to six times cheaper than an equivalent car with either a petrol or a diesel engine. When we tested the ID4, Volkswagen told us it reckoned that a typical user would save about £730 a year in operating expenses over what they'd pay to run a comparable combustion engine model. We'd expect the savings with a Q4 to be of the same kind of order. What else? Well, you won't only be saving money on energy costs. Driving into congestion charge zones will be free, and you should also make savings thanks to zero-rated road tax. And big savings in benefit in kind tax, like its EV competitors. The Q4 has a BIK rating of 2% across the range. Compare that to 37% for an Audi Q5, 40 TDI diesel, even a supposedly electrified Q5, 50 TFSI E plug-in hybrid is rated at 14%. The 2% BIK rating is down, of course, to the fact that, like any EV, this one has a zero emissions CO2 figure. Though, of course, the energy to drive this car has to cause pollution somewhere. This Audi has a well-to-wheels carbon contribution of 51.5 grams per kilometre, and the Q4 has an efficiency rating of 2.8 miles per kilowatt, which isn't actually that brilliant by class standards. Anyway, this Audi is some way from being completely green. Residual values look competitive. Independent experts reckon that after three years and 60,000 miles, a typical 40 e-tron sport model, like the one we're trying here, would still be worth 45.6% of its original value. To give you some class perspective, that's the same as a comparable Mercedes EQA Sport and a Volvo XC40 Recharge, but less than a comparable Polestar 2 long-range dual motor, which manages 49%. Insurance groupings range, as usual with an EV, are unreasonably high. The base 35 e-tron is rated at between groups 26 and 29e. For this 40 e-tron model, it's group 29 to group 33e. And for the twin motor 50 e-tron Quattro, it's groups 37 to 39e. As usual with EVs, a Q4 driver will enjoy lower maintenance costs than would be needed for a combustion model. Obviously, no oil changes are required, and regenerative braking means that the brake pads are designed to last the life of the car. There's a fixed servicing schedule with a basic inspection after two years, unlimited mileage, and subsequent services every year, or 20,000 miles. Audi says that its aim is to make sure that the battery pack lasts as long as the car too. And sure enough, that battery pack is warranted to have at least 70% of its usable capacity after eight years or 100,000 miles. Rather refreshingly, by the way, the battery size figures Audi quotes for this car are net usable ones, a more honest trend started by Tesla. Other brands tend to quote gross battery sizes, then put the net usable size in the small print. There's the usual unremarkable three-year or 60,000-mile Audi warranty. You can, as usual with the brand, pay more to extend to either four years and 75,000 miles or five years and 90,000 miles. And there's a 12-year body protection guarantee, a three-year paint warranty, and three years of roadside assistance, which includes European breakdown cover. What else might you need to know? Well, green bearded friends might like to learn that Audi has a sustainably sourced policy for the many of the materials used in making this car. The artificial leather and dynamica material used, for instance, in the upholstery on S-Line models is made from 45% recycled polyester from various sources, including PET plastic bottles. Where pulse cloth is used for a Q4's model upholstery, then every car produced will account for 26 1.5-litre plastic bottles as part of its manufacture. 
And talking of manufacture, it's worth remembering that, like all VW Group EVs, this one's a carbon neutral product manufactured at the group's state-of-the-art plant at Zwickau, the most efficient factory in Europe, which uses 100% green electricity. Where the plant's emissions are unavoidable in things like transport and logistics, the VW Group compensates by contributing to internationally recognised climate protection initiatives, forest protection projects in Borneo, for instance. So an Asian farmer's land might be reforested as a result of your Q-Force creation. Which all sounds great until you consider the fact that with technology as it is at present, automotive EV batteries are going to end up in landfills at the end of their working lives, which is about as far from being green friendly as it's possible to get. The Volkswagen Group, like other industry giants, is working hard to try and change this, building a pilot plant at Salzgitter that either gives batteries a second life or uses them as a source of raw materials after recycling. It's all part of the huge investment the VW Group conglomerate has made here, but one with an eye very much on its bottom line. From 2021 onwards, EU law requires automakers to meet an across-the-range average emissions level of 95 grams per kilometre, with a fine of 95 euros for each gram over the limit, a figure then multiplied by every car sold. As a result of that, it was estimated recently that to minimise punitive financial penalties as a result of this policy, Audi needs to sell one electric Q4 for every two conventionally engined models. The stakes here, in other words, could hardly be higher. In surveying the VW Group MEB platform, mid-sized SUV electric vehicles launched to date, we always felt that this Wolfsburg conglomerate was leaving room for an Audi model able to deliver this engineering with a touch more polish and driver-orientated luxury. And so it proves here. The Q4 e-tron has the size of a smaller mid-sized EV, but the finish, luxury and to some extent the driving dynamics of an electric crossover from the next class up. That for larger EV models like the Jaguar I-Pace and the Mercedes EQC. In that respect, it's far more like a BMW iX3 than a Volkswagen ID4. If you're looking at those Jaguar, Mercedes or BMW models, we think you should be looking at a Q4 e-tron too, because it'll satisfy you in much the same way. If that's your perspective, the premium prices being asked here will seem reasonable. If it isn't, you'll start to question just why a car which shares pretty much every significant aspect of its engineering with comparable Volkswagen, Skoda and Cupra EVs can be worth so much more. A matter of perspective then. With Audi, t'was ever thus. Yet, this is more than merely a mainstream product with a bit of extra tinsel. Even with the badges removed, you'd know immediately from looking at this car and sitting in it that it was a more aspirational product. And it can be customised to the tastes of richer buyers in a way that a comparably engineered Volkswagen, Skoda or Cupra model could never be. Aside from the question of price, the main issue you might have here is one of driving range, which sees this Audi lagging a little behind class leaders in this regard, or quite a lot behind in base 35 e-tron form. You can bet the engineers are working feverishly on that. And anyway, if you can afford to drop a sum as large as is required for one of these, it's almost certain that there'll be another longer running combustion model already in your driveway probably another Audi, which leaves us with what? Well, undoubtedly a strong proposition. You could even call it fuel-proof.